QuickBooks Online 2024, entering the sales receipt form and deposit form. Get ready and some coffee because QuickBooks Online is even quicker to the trigger than Quick Draw McGraw. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation. Opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time, the reports, they're on the left. We're in the favorites. We're right clicking on that balance sheet so we can open a link in a new tab. Same with the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement. And right click in the trial balance to open those in a new tab. If you don't have that trial balance in the favorites, you can search for it. Let's tab to the right, close up the hamburger, and change the range up top. We're going from 010124 to 022824. Let's do a side by side month breakout here and then we'll run it to refresh it. Tapping to the right, closing up the ham boogie, and same activity of 010124, tab 022824, and then let's see a month by month, side by side, refreshing the report. One more time on the trusty trial balance, closing that hamburger and changing that range, 010124 to 022824, and then we'll run it to refresh it. We could do this one side by side as well, although it's not as useful on the month by month breakout. All right, let's go back to the balance sheet. This time we're continuing on with the second month of operations. We're into our normal sales cycle. So some of these forms will be repetitive, but we'll enter them a little bit faster. We'll add some more uh, people. We'll add this, the customers as we do the data input and we'll link some of the transactions together in one uh, presentation so you can see how they, the flow th uh, goes through multiple forms. So this time, if I look at my flow chart over here, this is the desktop flow chart, but we're using it for the online because we're just looking at the flow of the forms, which is basically the same for any accounting system. We're on the customer side of things now, recalling that when we're selling stuff, we could have a very easy sales system if you're in like gig work or something like that, and you're just getting paid, let's say like by YouTube or something, then you could just wait till it clears the bank and record the sales with a deposit form. But typically in a full service business, you're gonna need to use the sales forms either on a cash based system where you're at a cash register or something, you might enter the sales receipts form. Or if you have an accrual system where you have to do the work for first, invoice the client, then you're gonna have to enter an invoice and track the accounts receivable to then receive payment on the invoice. We will imagine this one here. We're on the sales receipt. We're in the store at this point in time. We're collecting the money at the same time we do the work. We're sick of trusting people, trusting people for suckers. We get paid at this point in time and then we give you the inventory because, and we have locks on the doors and bars on the walls and whatnot so that we, cause even though we have a really nice couch and stuff, uh, so it still looks nice and don't be, you still wanna come in to buy some guitars and stuff, but it's secure that people feel safe. So now we, we've got the, the sales receipt. Now, when you enter the, the information into the cash register, uh, uh, note that uh, it's gonna record the sale at that point in time, cash is gonna be received or a credit card payment or some kind of electronic transfer, possibly a check. You could put this sales receipt directly into the bank account. But typically if you're at a cash register, you don't wanna do that because 
part of the payments you might be receiving is like cash payments, for example, in which case, if you deposit them directly into the checking account, they're not physically in the bank. And you're going to take those multiple cash payments at the end of the night because we do it nightly here because we don't want to hold on to too much cash because it's dangerous. We're in, we're in California for crap. So then we go to the bank and we deposit it into the, into the bank account as one lump sum rather than as a bunch of different uh, sales deposits so that when we reconcile, we can see it come through the bank feeds. A similar thing will be the case if you have, say, uh, credit card payments, because the credit card company will batch your payments together, deposit them into the checking account as one lump sum. So you're going to want to then use a clearing account to go in and out of so that you can record the deposit as one lump sum that will match the bank reconciliation. So we'll do both of those transactions in one uh, one presentation this time. Let's go to the first tab, selecting the good old drop down. We're in the customer area. We're not going to do the invoice. We're doing the sales receipt. I'm not going to give you the guitar before you pay me this time. I've had enough of that. I've had enough of that kind of business. I see where we're at now. I see what's happening here. So we're going to say this is going to be Garcia uh, Guitars. Garcia Guitars is going to be our new customer. Now, if you're at a cash register, you might not even know the name of the people you're selling to because all you really, you might have a generic customer because you would like their name for the mailing address or what, but, but they might only be one-off customers depending on what you do. If you sell, if you sell at a food truck or something, you're probably not collecting people's names unless you need to call out the name to give them, you know, the, the, the food. So in any case, I'm going to say tab. And so we've got the information here. So that looks good. We would like to collect their email possibly for our mailing list, but we don't need to send out this form to the client. We could though, we could give them the receipt by email as well, but we're not going to put the email in. Tab in through it, tab in through. We're going to say this happened on the 20th. Let's say 02 for some 02 20, uh, 24, let's say. And we'll tab through numbers populating automatically. The location will help us with the sales tax calculation if you're in California or if you're in, you know, the United States, which will be dependent on the location that you're at because it's a state and local tax, not a federal tax. And then the payment type. So if we get a check, then it would be pretty clear that the sales receipt would enter our bank at the same amount as the check amount. Uh, but if we get cash, that's where we might have that system where we're going to have to deposit the cash at the end of the night. We might end, um, end up depositing it, it like three times a day here, considering, considering, because that's just a safer thing to do, considering where we located our store. But, you know, th that, that, that'll group the deposits together. Now, if you have a credit card, then again, you're going to have to use the clearing account. So if you have multiple forms of payment, then you're probably going to use one system. In other words, you don't want to use like deposit the clearing account for some of your sales and then the checking account for others because it's likely that you'll mix them up as you're communicating with a client. You want to keep it on one or the other. So if all of your uh, payments are in electronic transfers and they're going to hit your bank account in the same format as you receive them, then you could go to the checking account. But if you get multiple forms of payment like cash versus credit card versus checks versus electronic transfers, then you're probably just going to want to use one system, the clearing account, so that you're not toggling back and forth between the two. So I'm just going to pretend it's cash again, even though it's going to be a large dollar amount because the cash I think is easiest to visualize. So then we're going to say that it's going to be the product we're going to have is, all right, so we're going to be putting it into the, into the clearing account. I think I said that instead of the checking account. And then it's going to be, we, we want an EPSP that we're imagining we're selling at the cash register of the store. We're selling two of those. So that's nice. Those are expensive. That's a $600 guitar according to this. This is not real Epiphone. You can't buy it for that. I don't know how much it costs. Okay, this is just a practice problem. So this is an ELP. That's our standard guitar. We sell a lot of those. That's like our go-to. And so we're going to sell two of those. And so that times 500, those are both subject to sales tax. This being populated by the system because we entered our items in a prior presentation. So now we're in month two, everything flowing along nice and easy. I can have someone do the data input that doesn't know anything about anything. They basically sleep under the counter until someone brings them a guitar 
and then they can punch this in without having to with with one eye still in sleep mode and that's how easy it is because we set up all the other stuff so then over here we've got the amount now the sales tax that we're going to have is based on location i'm going to change it to the generic five percent for our practice problem so generic five percent on the sales tax which is a state and local tax in the united states similar to a usage tax in other areas what's this going to do it's going to be increasing the not the accounts receivable it's like an invoice except that accounts receivable doesn't go up we're going to be getting paid 2310 in the form of we're imagining cash that we're going to be receiving the other side, i know that's a lot of cash it's kind of weird but that's the thing and then the other side is going to go to the revenue account but it's going to be going to it for the 2200 what we earned the difference the 110 not going to the income statement but being a balance sheet account for sales tax payable because that's the price of us doing business here it's supposed to be protection money but i don't feel like my stuff is safe but in any case that's going to the for protection money to the state and local and then and then we also have the inventory that's going to be going down not by the amounts on the form but driven by the items and then the cost of goods sold which is the expense account uh, related to us selling is going to go up the net impact on net income being the 2200 sales price minus the cost of goods sold and the inventory subledger will be impacted going down in unit as well as dollar amount Whew, that's a lot going on. Let's go ahead and save it. See, all that's happening, even with that half asleep worker that just crawled out from under the counter to ring up the thing because someone brought a guitar up. So now we're going to go to the tab to the right and check it out. Let's go to the run the report. And we put it not into the checking account, but we put it into the payments to deposit. So we're going to go into there and there it is there's the 2310 that's the full amount including the sales tax let's go back let's go to the income statement and run that one and we can see in the sales of product there it is february sales that's for the 2200 on the sales receipt that is in two lines because we had two different line items it's trying to track i think the inventory on a item by item first in first out method and then the difference between those two went back to the balance sheet, not on the income statement for what we have to pay for the protection money to the government, even though I don't feel very protected. So we have over here, the, the, that's going to go to these items because that's who we pay the money to. So that's going to be the sales tax. And then we're going to go back to, and then also the inventory is going to go down. So if I go into the inventory and we go into that then we could see a decrease of the inventory by amounts that aren't actually on the form because they're driven by the items notice there's two items here and you see three items over here you might ask why is that the case i think they're trying to track on a first in first out basis method which has different layers and whatnot so i think that's kind of why that looks like that in case you're wondering if you go to the tab to the right then the cost of goods sold is the other side of that. So if I go into the cost of goods sold, boom, we have that. And we could see the net impact on net income of the sales receipt is this 2,200 minus the 1760 uh, gets us the net income impact of the 440. Now, if you asked the guy that crawled out from under the counter to put the data input to input this invoice and make the sale, would they know any of this? No, they, the guy wouldn't know a thing but he could still do the data input. That's what, that's how good the system that we have is to, that's set up. All right, now we also have a sub ledger. If I go to the tab to the right, and then I right click on it and duplicate it, we can track the inventory, which went down on a sub ledger. So let's open that up and let's go to the reports on the left and close the hand boogie and type in inventory valuation summary. And so there we have it. So now we've got the units of inventory and the cost adding up to, is this the current day? I need to bring it up to 022824 because I'm working in the future. I don't work in the present. I work in the future. 7938. So that should tie out to what's on the balance sheet for inventory. 7938. Very nice. Now, if we track this form internally, I'm going to go to the first tab and I'm going to go into what I would call the, the customer center or the sales on the left. 
it's less likely that we'll need to go in here because we're not tracking the invoices. But we might want to see our sales over here as well. So if I go into all sales, I could then search by the, by the transactions of sales receipts and there's our sales receipts. I don't need the whole invoice tab if I'm making my payments or, or if I'm working at a cash register because I'm not tracking the accounts receivable. Thank goodness because that's kind of a difficult thing to do. But if I have to track accounts receivable often in my own business, so uh, so I'm not against that. That's uh, You got to do what you got to do, but it's easier not to have to track the accounts receivable and just say, I want you to pay me when I do the work right here, right now. We'll shake hands, things, and then that's it. But then I can go to the recently paid items and then Garcia Guitars, here we have it. If I go into that, and then we have uh, the sales receipt. So it's been paid, it's done, good and done, ready to go. Okay, so let's do another one. Note that it's in, it's in undeposited funds now. So the next step is to take it out of undeposited funds or deposits to be paid. However, I'm gonna make another sale so that we can see the grouping system that we need and why we need to use undeposited funds, why we didn't put it directly into the checking account, that is. Let's go to the tab to the left and just note, if I was to look at the deposit right now, uh, which is the plus button, then you can see that that sales receipt is now being populated up top. So let's add another sales receipt. Let's say we're sitting at our, the, that person went back to sleep uh, under, the, under, the, under the sales table, but then someone else bought a guitar and they woke him up. And so he's like, okay, I'll enter the guitar, dude. So we go into a sales receipt. He's like, what do you want? What's your name? Anderson, repeat customer, Mr. Anderson. So, oh, I know you, dude. Well, another guitar, that's great. You're a great customer. And then Anderson's got all these guitars that we're gonna purchase. So uh, the payment, we're gonna say it's cash again. Most likely it would be like a credit card, would be a similar kind of thing, but I'm just going to imagine cash because I think it's easier to visualize the physical payment. That's why we're putting it into payments to deposit instead of directly into the checking account. And then we're going to say this is going to be a DUC, which is a, a ukulele. So he wants two of those at $32. And then we're going to also say that he wants an e, EPR, which is an Epiphone uh, Riviera guitar. It's like, okay. Oh, dude, that's a cool one. I was playing it in the store like a second ago. It was really good. G-I-U-S-A. This is going to be a G-I-U-S-A, a Gibson USA. That's a classic, man. That's a classic. Okay. All right, and then, so if we add that up, we're gonna say that that comes out to 2,094, and the sales tax, I'm gonna, I had to click down here to have it calculate, but I'm gonna make it go to the generic five. So what's this gonna do? It's the same thing. It's gonna be going, when I record this, it's gonna be increasing, not the cash account, but the payments to deposit for the full amount, similar to an invoice, but instead of AR going up, the deposit account, because we got paid at this point in time, 2,198.70. The other side going to the revenue account for the amount we charge, not including the sales tax, 2,094. The sales tax being a liability account going up for $104.70. Then inventory is going to go down, not by the amounts on the sales receipt, but driven by the items and the cost of goods sold. The expense account related to us selling these guitars is going to go up for that same amount that the inventory went down, net impact on net income is the sales price, 2,094 minus the cost of goods sold and the inventory units will be going down uh, as we, in units as well. You, you got that store sales guy that's gonna go back to sleep under the counter? Oh yeah, dude, that's cool. I can totally explain that. And so we're gonna say, save it and close it. And then let's go back to the balance sheet and run it. Okay, so then in the in the payments to deposit, we're gonna see then that we have our deposit for the full amount for the next invoice. That includes the sales tax back. If I go to the profit and loss, we now have two amounts that are, are in here in the sale of product. 
It put them in here possibly in multiple line items, but we can see the number. So we could see all of these are the sales price, not including the sales tax, the difference between the sales price and the amount that we received or collected is going into a payable account for the, the state over here. It's our protection money we send to the state uh, so they can laugh at us when our stuff is stolen. They just laugh in our face, ha <laughs> ha, give us more sales tax. And then we're gonna say it's, that's gonna be up here. And then we also have the inventory, wait, is that the right spot? Yeah, and then inventory is gonna go down. And so we have inventory, if I go into the inventory and we see there's Mr. Anderson, inventory is going down by amounts not actually on the sales receipt, but driven by the item. So the system knows, just like when you check something out at like the grocery store and you have that auto checkout and you know the sales price, but you know the system's actually doing more work and recording the cost too. And then we go into the cost of goods sold on the income statement. And we have then the cost of goods sold broken out, net impact on net income, sales minus the cost of goods sold. And if I go to my inventory, we have a sub ledger for the inventory 6266, breaking it out. If I go to my sub ledger, boom, we've got the inventory 6266 and our units of inventory broken out. All right, so now we're like, okay, we've got all this money and we know that we know that our protection money isn't going to be helping us out and so we're hanging on to too much cash, man. You're hanging you're pulling too much time. You got to pull you got to put that money in the bank. So we've got this money, we're going to the bank. We're going to we're going to we're going to look out and make sure that the coast is clear and then we're going to go to the bank with our 4000 five hundred eight dollars and seventy cents and see if we can make it make it there so then so 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 i'm going to pull that out of here and we're going to put it into the checking account so we can do that with the deposit form so if we go back onto the first tab we're going to say that uh, if we go into the deposit form bank deposit form then it's going to go into the checking account let's put it at the same day so it's the end of the day now but not too late we don't want it to be at night because it's risky at night, you know, you got to be in the middle of the day and you have our escort. We have an escort helping us out to transfer the money and take it physically to the bank. But we're not going to put it in the bank as of these two dollar amounts, but rather combine them together into one, one deposit. So I'm going to select both of these. Why do we need to do that? Because if it showed in the bank account as these two separate deposits, we wouldn't be able to tie it out to the bank feeds or bank reconciliation because the bank reconciliation is coming from the bank, which will have one deposit of 4,508.70 ,00 instead of two deposits of these two amounts. And we'd have to, you could combine them together when you do the bank feeds or the reconciliations. But if you do that, it gets complicated. So the if you find yourself doing that, you're combining things together, when you do the bank feeds or bank reconciliation, your system probably isn't optimized. That process should be easy. And the way you make it easy is you use this clearing account. Now we did it with cash here, but you might do the same thing with a credit card payment, which could even be a little bit more complicated because you'll have to figure out how the credit card payment groups the payments together and then gives you the deposit and you have to work with them to make to get the system set up and they might charge you fees so you might actually have to add a fee down here go into like a fees account like bank bank service charge or something uh bank fees and services and then you might have something that would be like a negative 50 dollars or something in here uh 50. boom and so then it so then it would bring it down so you might end up needing to do something like that if you're dealing uh, with the credit cards or some other intermediary that's helping you to collect the deposits, the deposits, the money, group them, some other financial institution, and then get them over to your bank. The bottom line is we want it to be hitting our bank in the same format in our system as will actually be in the bank reconciliation. All right, so we'll do that. This is going to increase the checking account by that dollar amount and decrease the deposit, the funds to be deposited account. And so let's save and close it. And then if I go over to the balance sheet and run it, we're going to say, let's go into the checking account. 
And so now we have the deposit happening. The deposit's happening on the 20th here. It's kind of throwing us off because I have this one at the end because we kind of went out of order for that uh, for the loan payment so we could see them both at the same time. But there's, I believe, the deposit we just did. And then if I go back and we take a look at the uh, payments to deposit, we can see it's back down to zero, like a good clearing account should be. It should just go up and then right back down again. And it shows you the ins and outs. It doesn't show us a one lump sum, but this one gives you the detail. So you can tick, you can tie, and that's what should happen. It should go up and back down. You should be able to tick it out, tick and tie it off, and it goes back down to zero. That transaction had no impact, of course, on the profit and loss because the transaction that had an impact on the profit and loss was the sales form because that's when we actually did the work. All right, it's time to check out the trustee trial balance. This is where we stand. This is where we stand on the balance sheet. This is where we stand on the P&L, and we can combine them both together and just think about the trusty trial balance to see where we stand. And so here, here is where we are. This is where we are at at this point in time. Remembering the trial balance, balance sheet on top of the income statement, assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expense, checking account, asset. We've increased the checking account in this one. We didn't have to use the accounts receivable. That's the other asset for invoices. We have inventory. We dealt with inventory here, it being an asset. We have the investment account, asset, payments to deposit, an asset account, kind of like a cash account, but it's in other current assets. Prepaid insurance, asset accumulated depreciation, contra asset that's linked intimately to the property, plants, and equipment, in our case, furniture and equipment. Then that assets represent what the company has. Liabilities represent who has claim to them. Liabilities and equity. Who has claim to the assets? Liabilities, third party, accounts payable, visa, the government uh, for, the, for the sales tax, the government for the payroll tax, and then our claim, opening balance equity uh, investments, our owner's investment in our equity account, like retained earnings if it was a corporation, and everything from equity down to the income statement, income and expense accounts down below, could be squished into one number. Everything from here down below is the income statement. So if I was to take the credits minus the debits, I would have a credit balance of net income. And that net income could be thought of as part of owner's equity or retained earnings. So the balance sheet is one number, should be one number of retained earnings in essence, and then the investment, right? So if I can see that, let's just show that. If I go up to 010125 and 010125, just to show that process every time, so now the whole income statement's been squished together in the owner's equity, similar to the retained earnings account, if it were a corporation.